She's from a village in Scandinavia, a little seaside hamlet known to all the locals as the Devil's Village. Place wasn't known for devils, though. It was known for octopus. See, this was one of the few places in Europe where they ate octopus customarily. Anyway, there's this cult of crazies who for some reason hate the village with a passion. Then, when she was just a teenager, things get bad. These nutcases get their hands on some weapons and attack the village. Overnight, her sleepy little fishing town becomes a war zone. They round up all the villagers and execute them one by one. Except for that girl. They had something else planned for her. Something a whole lot worse than dying. Calling her the devil's child, they forced her to do the kind of thing you'd expect from one of Lucifer's own. After they made her torture her family and friends, they made her kill them. The whole time they were forcing her to laugh, howl like some sort of demon, like she was enjoying it. What was she gonna do? Say no? They'd kill her too. So she let fear take control and did exactly as they told her. She butchered the bodies of the ones she loved and laughed while she did it. And as she bathed in their blood, it gradually turned from deep red to jet black. To her, it looked like the ink of an octopus. The experience scarred her deep. Ever since then, she hasn't stopped laughing. Only, that ain't really laughter.
How old was she? I'd say about 20. But she had years of soldiers' rage hidden away in that youthful body of hers. Soldiers? Yeah, the soldiers of Ake, a place that hasn't seen peace in a long, long time. She was captured by one side or another and kept caged up like an animal, along with God knows how many other kills. Anonymous violence. Exactly. It's unknown whether her captors were with the government or the rebels. In any case, they got their kicks by abusing these helpless little kids day after day after day. That constant barrage, that battlefield rage slowly built up inside their bodies, their minds. The kids tried to keep each other's spirits up, always clinging to the hope that someone would come to their rescue, barely surviving off of scraps of food. But those soldiers didn't stop. They called the kids parasites and shit-eating ravens. Beat them even harder. Then one morning, the soldiers just up and left, leaving the surviving kids to be eaten alive by the birds. Almost like one of those sky burials. One by one, their bodies were picked apart by ravens' beaks, until finally the flock came for her. But by some miracle, their beaks cut her bonds instead. And like that, she was liberated. In that instant, she was filled with an uncontrollable rage, and it smothered her soul. She ripped the ravens pecking at her to pieces, and then went after the soldiers. And when she finally caught up with them, she waited until nightfall like a hunter awaiting its prey. They say that when a raven cries, a man dies. And that's exactly what happened that night. Screeching and cawing, she killed every last living being in the camp, both the soldiers and the civilians they'd enslaved. In her eyes, there was no longer a difference. The cruelty her friends had suffered, the pain and humiliation she'd endured. Hers was the distillation of the rage that decades of war had imparted on those soldiers. You don't need me to tell you there's whole nations in Africa tearing themselves apart in the name of ethnic cleansing. 
Well, she was born into that environment. When she was a little girl, her village was attacked by rival armed factions. Her parents and siblings were slaughtered, and she was left a refugee. She took her last surviving relative, her baby brother, and ran as far as she could away from the war zone. One day, they came across an enemy unit, so she took her brother and hid in an abandoned shack. And then her brother started to cry. She knew that if the soldiers heard the noise, they would find them and kill them both. So she wrapped her hand as tight as she could around his mouth. As the footsteps gradually went away, she came back to her senses. Her brother wasn't crying anymore. Horrified, she pulled her hand away, covered in sweat and spit. He wasn't breathing. They say wolves eat their own pups when they die. She was spotted wandering through the thick of battle, carrying her dead brother in her arms. She had visions, too. A wolf walking alongside her. Every night, the wolf would howl and cry, just like her brother did that day. Eventually, she made it to a government-run refugee camp. But by then, her brother's body had rotted away. The camp was crowded with refugees like herself and little children like her brother. Day and night, she was tormented by the cries of babies. The wolf that followed her heard her sorrowful screams and answered. He made his way around the camp, and one by one, he silenced the children. She tried to stop it, but she was powerless to stop the wolf. A few days passed, and on the eve of the enemy's raid, there wasn't a child left. The adults who survived were torn up pretty bad. Of course, there was never any wolf in that camp. She was the one who killed those babies. But she couldn't bring herself to admit it. She couldn't bear the thought of herself going from one baby to the next, howling like a wolf, snuffing out their little lives. And she never did, even as crying wolf, a lonely beast forever stalking the battlefield.
Atlantis came from South America. She was born and raised in a country racked by never-ending civil wars. Her village was attacked by enemy forces and burned to the ground. This was when she was still a little girl. Hunted by enemy death squads, she was separated from her family. She barely managed to escape with her life. Ended up in the basement of this one building. It was full of corpses that had been dumped there. Almost all of them had been tortured to death. She was petrified with fear. And then, she heard the sound of heavy boots on the floor above her, followed by shrieking screams. The kind that would make every hair on your body stand straight up. She had stumbled across a makeshift torture chamber. Somebody had locked the door, and she was trapped. It was dark, it was dank, and it was full of a wretched stench. She couldn't sleep with the screams of torture victims all around her. All she could do was sit curled up in one corner of the room, trembling. A week passed, then ten days. She managed to keep hydrated by drinking the filthy water pooled up on the floor, but there was no food. Being trapped in that kind of place, half crazy from hunger, did a serious number on her mind. Did you know female mantises eat their mates? The screams went on day and night. She covered her ears, but it didn't help. And then she was saved by a little black mantis that taught her how to block out the screams, how to plug up her inner ears. What the hell are you talking about? I'm saying, Snake, that when she couldn't stand the hunger any longer, she started feeding on the corpses, but only the male ones. She didn't realize who was doing it. In her mind, it was a female mantis devouring her mates. It was like one big twisted waking dream. There was no mantis, of course. It was all a hallucination. Nothing more than some story spun by another person she created inside. Her unstable mind was what made her so vulnerable. Later, they ripped out what was left of her psyche with drugs and hypnosis and implanted the persona of Psycho Mantis. It wasn't her will that controlled the B&Bs. It was Psycho Mantis, half assimilated into her soul, pulling the strings. Screaming Mantis was just another puppet. Anyway, she survived several weeks down in that hellhole and finally got back to the surface. But the screams in her head didn't subside. They would always be with her. Only this time, they weren't real. The inner earplugs didn't work anymore. The Black Mantis had disappeared. There was no place left to escape. Which is why she was always screaming. To drown out the ones in her own head. 